So this lecture is seismic hazard assessment, which is in a way coming back around. I talked about seismic hazard assessment in the first lecture, and so I'm just going to elaborate on it using some of the information, especially there's a chapter nine in the McAlpin textbook, so please hold the McAlpin textbook up. So this one, chapter nine is the seismic hazard assessment that's online and easy to get. And so I used some slides from there, but then I added some other uh, information that is maybe a little bit more um, up to date or, or some improvements even. So I'll talk about these uh, points, the uh, overview, uncertainty, and determining moments. So we've already talked about this once, so I'll go quickly through that. Recurrence interval, uh, segmentation, we've also talked about, so move through that quickly. Discuss rupture scenarios, recurrence models we've talked about, and then come back and remind us of the Edaform California earthquake rupture forecast as an a, a, a active example. So there's two kinds of seismic hazard assessment usually. There's deterministic, which is where you compute the worst case scenario for a single site. So this would be something like a nuclear power plant. And you don't care about time. You just say, this is it. This is the biggest possible earthquake for that place uh, or the strongest ground motions for that place. And the alternative, which is more commonly done, is probabilistic seismic hazard assessment where the hazards at a site or over a region are specified as the worst effects that are likely to occur with a given probability of exceedance within a given time period, which is called the exposure time, related to the design life of the facility or with the given annual probability. So you see this probabilistic one has lots of statements about how likely, which means probable, and also time period. So, and the, the, the given time period, usually we think of, uh, you know, most, most, uh, Homes, you know, most buildings people live in are designed to be built for a few decades. And so you want to compute the hazard for a few decades or for sometimes nuclear power plants are built for somewhat longer, like 50 year time scales. So we need to calculate in those 50 years, what do we expect? So then the ingredients for seismic hazard assessment uh, are, you know, we need to specify the sources, which means finding the fault and characterizing their geometries. And then sometimes we can't find all the faults, so we have to just say, well, there's some unknown fault or set of faults in the region that contribute some amount of potential hazard, and so that's called an area source. And then we have a recurrence model or earthquake rate model, and so these are our two that the geologists of our type mostly spend time with. But once we have that information, we have to have a ground motion model, which takes the seismic energy from the source to the site. And this is usually done by other geologists and engineers, and it's a very uncertain part of this whole activity. And then we have to estimate how likely a certain peak acceleration will be exceeded, which is kind of propagating all of our uncertainty and time through the process. So here is the kind of global size and hazard map for uh, Southeast Asia, and it shows the, you know, this 10% uh, probability in 50 years peak ground acceleration, and so these would be the the peak ground acceleration. So the brown means 1, 1 G, so people flying in the air. So we can see that at least based on this model, the relatively speaking, the Sumatra and Java uh, hazard is relatively low compared to China and Philippines and also Papua. And that's, that's a question because it's probably controlled by the input data. So there's not that much input data at this level of detail on the, especially the upper plate structures. So the Great Sumatran Fault and any of the Java and uh, Serp upper plate faults. So, I mean, there's a little bit here. This might be showing something for Chimandiri and Limbang is in the model, but it seems maybe not too good, too much detail. It's fine in a very regional sense. So McAlpin, he talks about how, you know, the geologic data 
what we gather and we determine things like slip rate, recurrence interval, elapsed time, displacement per event, fault geometry, and we use that information to basically do two things. One is the fault zone segmentation, and the second one is the recurrence model. So you can see these two are basically these two right here. And so they rely a lot on geologic data, although you can use also seismological and geodetic data. Uh, and that gives us the fault zone segmentation basically gives us the magnet, expected magnitudes. And then the recurrence model feeds in to have, uh, give us the hazard model. So one thing that comes up a lot is uncertainty. And there's these two words that we could spend a long time discussing. But basically, when you talk about uh, uncertainty, they try to differentiate two kinds of uncertainty. So the first kind is aleatory, which basically is interpretation error. So is this the right model? Are we, are we, you know, is this a normal fault or a reverse fault? That's an aleatory uncertainty. Whereas epistemic uncertainty is measurement error. So the time of the earthquake is plus or minus 100 years or it's plus or minus 50 years. So those are two different kinds of error because usually we can improve that systemic errors by getting more data. <clears throat> Sometimes we can't improve the aleatory error because it's just, you know, Mudrid may say reverse and I say normal and we can argue forever, right? And that's just the aleatory uncertainty. So, you know, like Lembon's fault, you know, maybe it, some people might argue normal, but Overall, there's kind of a preferred opinion that it's reversed, but there, that difference, that uncertainty is called the aleatory uncertainty. So <clears throat> these words, when I first heard them, I was always thinking, oh, what? these are strange words, but uh, they help us specify the, this critical part of the probabilistic seismic hazard assessment. So <clears throat> in terms of the, as we go through the, probabilistic seismic hazard assessment or ha seismic hazard assessment, we need to know moments. What's the expected magnitude? So we've already talked about this, but it's mostly geometrically defined by uh, parts of the, you know, we know that the seismic moment is the, you know, shear modulus times the average slip times the area. But we don't usually know all of that information. So instead of computing it directly, we use an empirical relationship between something we can easily observe and the moment. Like we think it's easy to observe surface rupture length, and we think it's easy to calculate the average displacement or measure the average displacement. And so we've discussed this some already. McAlpin talks about sources of uncertainty in measuring surface rupture length, for example. So, you know, when if the rupture goes into the ocean, we don't know, if, you know, then it's too short. Or... Uh, the endpoints are obscured by landslides. The rupture just dies out gradually. Uh, you know, there's some uncertainty in the recording, like these are last few are about the mapping. And this is especially a problem for older earthquakes. So, you know, these are, are uncertainties that basically make this relationship more noisy. There's also, I think, so those are kind of mostly epistemic uncertainties, but there's an aleatory uncertainties, which are, do we think that the relationship is the same for different kinds of faults? Strike, slip, reverse, and normal. And this paper, they think it's basically all the same, but different groups sometimes disagree, and they say, well, you know, a subduction zone will behave differently than strike slip fault. And certainly we know the area involved is going to be very different from a vertical fault to a shallowly dipping one. So uh, determining the expected moments is, is uh, you know, takes some care in understanding what, what's going on. So the other thing is, is the displacements. And so this is his table for maximum displacement, but it generally applies to looking at at displacements as a whole, which would contribute to the average displacement. So, you know, if you're averaging, you need to see as much of the rupture as possible. Maybe there's, you know, no good records of parts of the offset that are, you know, hidden. Um, 
also there's just, you know, observation problems. So this is how it's done, but it, it can be challenging. And then the other point is that, you know, when we make a measurement at the surface, like this would be the maximum displacement, or if we did the mean, you know, that's what's successful. The, the geologists can see this, but, you know, really we're trying to understand this, which is the true earthquake distribution, flip distribution. So, you know, the geologic data is just the surface offsets. And you can see here these contours of slip imply that there's a gradient up this. So the geologic measurements would be a minimum. The geodetic measurements, usually they span the fault and they provide maybe a pretty good average, uh, but they don't have a lot of detail. And then the seismological ones, we kind of discussed this yesterday, where basically the seismological moment is only really measuring where there's a lot of seismic energy coming, which is high frequency energy. But especially for these subduction zones, you see that they can have some slower slip at times. And that means the we won't see that slip from the seismology. We might, we would probably see it from the geodesy. So uh, these are concerns for using the displacements. So then he, he goes on to talk about slip rate. And so this is uh, kind of a complex table, but basically it's increasing, um, well, this would be kind of geologic information. So total slip, oh, let's say bedrock offset, and time since the fault began. So this is, you know, uh, you know, he says two kilometers over 20 million years, which is 1.1 1 .1 meters per thousand years or 0.1 millimeter a year rate. So this is probably, you know, the long, ter the long term geologic rate. And is it representative of what's happening now? We don't know, but we may have to assume it. And then geomorphic evidence would be offset landforms and the ages of them. So this tends to be more at the thousand to hundred thousand year time scale. And then the, the shortest time scale is, is maybe three dimensional trenching or really confident geomorphic offsets associated with single earthquakes. And those we might date with paleoseismic approaches. And so these are just the last earthquake or two. And so when we do slip rate, then we wonder, well, what's the most representative? This one's a long-term average, but we might be, it might be under or overestimating the rate. This one's a pretty long-term average. And then this is just a few cycles, so we don't know how variable it is. So he shows here, for example, this something called a slip history diagram, where we have <clears throat> the, uh, hmm, hold on. I feel this needs to be deleted. So here would be zero time today. And if we go back in the past, 40,000 years ago, this is displacement. So nothing's happening. And then there's an earthquake, two meters instantly, right? And then in this case, it's a very low slip rate fault, so 28,000 years pass, and then there's another earthquake. And this, he shows that they're both about two meters per event, so maybe characteristic. Um, but what do we do with rates? So you could say, well, the most recent earthquake was, it, you know, it was two meters of slip, and we think it took 28,000 years to accumulate that slip. So that's 0.7 millimeters per year but it's just one earthquake cycle. Then another one would be to say, well, the record begins here 40,000 years ago, and we come to the present at now, and there's four meters over that time. So that's a four meters over 40,000 year rate, which is actually somewhat faster than the one from the, the single earthquake. So, so you can see how you do slip rates at these short time scales can really vary a lot. And here's one where he puts in error, actually. So this makes, you know, there's some uncertainty in the age, some uncertainty in the displacement for both of these events. And so then we actually have even more challenges because there's uncertainties that mean there's kind of a big range in the possible slip rates over this time scale. 
MRE, so good question. Most recent earthquake. And this is the PE, the penultimate. So that means the one before the last. <clears throat> yeah, so these are common terms in this kind of discussion, MRE and PE. And then you start hearing MRE, 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 you know, and then it's, you just have to think of it. It's like its own little word. <clears throat> MRE, MRE, MRE. So, uh, que other questions? So, then let's come to earthquake recurrence interval, which is in this general topic. So, in general, the recurrence interval is just the, the displacement during a single earthquake divided by the slip rate minus creep rate if there's some creep, but most of the time we think this is zero. So, you know, if we have, uh, you know, one millimeter a year is S, and we think B is a meter, so every time there's an earthquake, it's one meter, then what's the recurrence interval? So D is one meter, and S is a millimeter per year. What's Ri? So D equals 1M, and S equals 1 millimeter per year, C equals 0. What's Ri? No, a thousand years. Right? Because a millimeter per year is the same as equals 1m per ky year, right? So then you just say, okay, so, you know, this equals 1m slash 1m per ky year, right? So that's the very simple-minded, oh, sorry, so then that's equals 1 ky year. So, this is a simple-minded approach we take to recurrence intervals. It's just we we and the slip rate is maybe more straightforward. We think we know the slip rate, or we can use the geodesy to say well, what the long-term the you know the Cato time scale rate is. We can use offset landforms. We can use the geology. So the S is maybe fairly straightforward. D, what a lot of times we assume is characteristic model, which is that it's always the same. And so then we just look at the last earthquake and we say, well, that's probably what happens in the next earthquake. But that's a big assumption, right? But maybe it works, because a lot of times we see that the earthquakes have similar slippery events. So this, in my view, is, you know, it's a simple equation, but it's a pretty complicated issue that goes into these assuming that you can make it so simple, right? So that's the easy, the simple way. And even though it's a simple equation, already you can see there's a lot of uh, conversation about it, you know, the assumptions that are going to it. The other way that's more uh, sophisticated would be to do the recurrence interval from failure earthquake ages because there's a lot more uncertainty that can be incorporated. This has no uncertainty in it, what we just calculated. So if you remember from our Oxcal example, remember this, what we did, and so we have these four earthquakes, E1, E2, E3, E4, and there's some age constraints about them. So Oxcal lets you do the full age model, which means including, which means we use the radiocarbon constraints bounding the earthquakes, so we can get the probability distribution for the ages of the earthquakes, which are shown here. There's two E3s. I don't know why in two E4, sorry. So E3, there's E4, E3, E2. They're repeated. Uh, but then what Oxcal also lets us do is find the best uh, or compute the recurrence interval between them, and that's what's shown here. So we know that the recurrence interval isn't a single number. It's actually a probability distribution that, ha that has a 95% probability between in this case, 225 and 290. And then it has a mode at about 
65. So this is a better way to do it if you can characterize the uncertainty of all the parts of the study. Questions or comments? So now uh, a little bit about how do we think the earthquakes occur in a region so we can have, this is just supposed to show some arbitrary, you know, distance versus time. And so we can have these different kinds of uh, behaviors. So spatial clustering where there's just lots of earthquakes in one place or in one part of a fault and then nothing on that, in that place for a long time. And then somewhere else there's many. So this would be clustering in space and in, in time. Well, sorry, they're clustered in space, but they occur over some period of time. Then, in contrast, the temporal cluster is many earthquakes along the fault at the same time, but not in the same place. And then a trend would be something like North Anatolia, like it's a systematic trend, trend from, if you remember from the North Anatolian fault, which was I talked about in the Coulomb lecture, the earthquakes go from one end of the fault to the other over the 20th century. And they argue because of stress transfer. And then random is, you know, at least what a lot of earthquake reports looks like now, because of incomplete understanding, where we may still allow that random is a model. But you know, what we hope for is to find order in nature, right? So we, we hope we can find something with more structure. So comments about these? Model it's very generic, but so I know it's too bad. Uh, so far, Toyo's not here because he loves segmentation. Um, <laughs> so uh, you'll have to tell him because I know you guys learn together. So uh, I'm I'm just joking. But... Okay, so just say I I thought of him, uh, but I know he's busy probably. So. So the quote from McAlpin, he says, from a pillar seismic perspective, our main interest is in segments that rupture during large earthquakes. The question thus arises, do these shorter segments leak to link to form earthquake rupture segments, and if so, how? The second problem is that for the that the basis for fault segmentation schemes is not always described in publications, or if it is insufficient, insufficient number of characteristics or inappropriate characteristics is used for segment definition. So He's sort of saying, okay, first of all, we, we like, we need to do segmentation because it helps us figure out expected moment and, uh, but also it's not always done the same way. And so he's kind of saying, if you do it, you have to explain how. So sometimes we can do a more strict earthquake segmentation because the same parts of fault break in successive earthquakes. And so we say, okay, well, that means that there'd be kind of a, recurring behavior for that fault. But what's more common is is traditional fault segmentation. And as we've discussed a little bit, Suchi asked this some, is, you know, maybe it's better to say section, to a more generic kind of statement of, I'm just dividing the fault up to make mm -hmm. it easier to think about it. But I'm not implying behavior, which means I'm not necessarily saying they're all going to break separately or together. And then that comes a little bit later in an interpretation phase. You say, so I assume that these sections behave like individual segments. But first, let's just divide it up by section. So he talks about then these, you know, different characteristics. There's earthquake segment, so just defined by where the earthquake occurred the last time. So that's definable. But there are other kinds of information, behavioral, structural, geologic, geometric. And the, the one that we, we use a lot, and we talk about these geometric segment sectioning, which is just steps and bends being important to start and stop earthquakes. But geology is good, you know, if there's, you know, big transitions in the geology around a fault, that probably says that it's, it's a different section. And structural kind of goes with geometric, in my opinion. And then behavioral is that we think we have seen changes in earthquake 
behavior in the past there. So changes in slip rate. Uh, it, we don't quite know that it was a historic rupture limit, but it looks like it's has a different recurrence interval or something from paleo seismology. So this is uh, kind of a big summary of a lot of work that we do. And just to remind you, this is the, the sort of sectioning that we're trying to think about is, you know, are there pieces of the fault that are, you know, maybe weaker and so they slip and so we're waiting for the barriers to, to break? Or is it the other way around? We have strong pieces of the fault and we, we need to see them rupture and, and until the whole fault is, has stress released. And this model is kind of more coming from the thinking of the subduction zones, like I showed for uh, the model from the Lay and Kanamori paper yesterday when we were talking about Japan, is we know that subduction zones have there's a lot of fault surface area, and not all the fault surface area behaves the same. And so that sectioning is kind of dividing it by how it behaves. Is it seismic? Is it, remember they said conditionally stable or aseismic? And so sometimes this is controlled by geology. Remember we talked about how if there's a, a island, like an oceanic island that's being subducted, it can partition things. Um, if there's some uh, transforms, we have different aged ocean ocean crust coming in on either side. That will be a, likely a big section boundary, so on. So I also mentioned this fault segmentation for a crustal structure where each one of the seg segment or section boundaries for this big normal fault is some kind of, of geometric irregularity, a salient, which is a big protrusion, a step, secondary fault, gaps. And we talked about this a few times. So Wisnowski, this kind of thinking is the main way of structural or geometric segmentation, how we use historic earthquakes to test it. And remember this point that for Wisnowski, the magic number is about five kilometers for a step over. Larger than that, it seems like it's a good section boundary. Less than that may not be that important. Okay, so let's talk about this uh what do we do with rupture scenarios? So let's say we have a lot of paleoseismic information along a fault. How do we build a model for earthquake recurrence? And so this is a, a paper from 2009 that comes from Biasi and Weldon. And these guys are some of the sort of biggest brains in paleoseismology, I think, in terms of how to do more with the data. And so on the San Andreas fault, we have a a pretty good record of earthquakes over time. So this is all paleoseismic data. And it's a pretty good distance. It's, you know, let's say 400 kilometers. And so what they did, and it's fairly complicated, but you can imagine, just look at this. So this would be the, the, the probability distribution for the timing of a paleo earthquake. So this little curve, would basically be, if you remember this, it's basically one of these guys tipped on its side. So it's time and, and the probability distribution for the time of that earthquake. And so as we go, go along the fault from one site to another, we might say, okay, well, site one has about the same time of earthquake as site two, so they probably are the same earthquake. But then you get to site three and you say, oh, it doesn't, doesn't overlap in time. So do we say, well, you know, maybe it wasn't recorded there, that earthquake. So we can keep going. And so then we go through. And so some ruptures can go through all the sites, even if they're not absor observed at one site. But these that go through, they have a penalty because they're, they're not supported by the data. And so what, what they do is they identify, they have all these PDFs and they, they just, you know, sort of reach into the box and they pull out possible earthquakes. And some are short and so they might fit just one site and some are long, but they don't fit all the data. So they're, 
have a little penalty. And so they accumulate many, 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 many of these, these earthquakes. And they also assume that as the earthquake gets longer, the slip increases. And so they use what they assume is a kind of a, uh, a, a elliptical distribution of slip. And so one thing they can also do then is to look at the cumulative displacement from this earthquake sequence to see how it compares to what we know. So here's the idea is if you start, here's time calendar year AD from 400 AD to the present. And this is distance along the fault. And these uh, CP, these are places where they have data. And so then they just, you know, try these different scenarios. And this particular scenario is the fewest ruptures. And so they just try, try, try. And so we get to the present and these were the earthquakes that would fit the integrated paleoseismology from all the sites. But the one problem is that this is the slip rate that they get. So they just add up all the slip. And this line here would be the expected slip rate. So it's not, you know, they're, they're getting too much slip down here in the south. So this model doesn't really explain the, explain all the data. It explains the earth, the, the, paleo seismology, but it doesn't explain the slip rate. So because there's too many big earthquakes in the south, which is to the right here, so then what they do is they say, well, what's the best mean displacement? So how does it fit the slip rate data the best? Which of these models? And so what you can see here, there are more earthquakes in there. that We need more small ones in the south because they don't have as much slip. And so that keeps the slip down as on this part of the fault, but we still can have big ones in the north. And so this is, is in my view, kind of the future of how to analyze these dense paleoseismic data sets is to try to use this kind of approach to, and they call the stringing pearls. So, you know, if you have a, like a pearl necklace, you have a pearl and it has a, a hole in it, right? And you want to put the, the needle with the thread through it. So each one of these is kind of like a, each earthquake is a pearl. So you have many pearls lined up. So can you connect through all the pearls or not? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can. But the title of this paper is called Stringing Pearls. Sorry. And so these then would be the necklaces they made. If you think of like a pearl necklace, but what they show is that they, they're, some of them are small necklaces on this side. So like small, like pearl bracelets. Uh, so all pearl necklaces were too big of earthquakes in that sense. If they were too long. Questions? Okay, so just keeping going on this. This is a bigger lecture, but we're making good progress. So... The other thing that goes into seismic hazard assessment is our recurrence model. So do we think that it's Gutenberg-Richter or characteristic? And so I showed this before. And remember, the argument that I made from our work is that the characteristic earthquakes are full rupture of the seismogenic width. And so they're always that's the explanation why they're always about the same offset at a point and why they're also always about the same magnitude, because they're width-limited. And this applies for crustal faults as well as uh, uh, subduction ones. So the big earthquakes rupture all the width they have, then they can go along some distance as defined by maybe segmentation. But the slip is controlled by that width, the narrower dimension. And so we, we so that explains why these characteristic events are always the biggest that can fit on the fault and the, uh, and why they tend to have the uh, the other definition that we see is there's constant slip at a point from earthquake to earthquake. So I talked about this before, but any questions? So one thing that happens then is, if you remember the the recurrence interval discussion before, the question is, well, how regular is recurrence? 
in other and in in a sense how constant is the slip per event and so this just shows a study that McAlpin did with uh, he had uh, uh, many earthquakes he had 161 recurrence intervals and and he divides the recurrence from an individual period between two earthquakes by the the average recurrence for that place and you can see that it's close to one which means that it looks like the data supports fairly regular recurrence intervals which means that probably the d is constant so if you remember this sorry this point i was making before when we were on this page if the ris are sorry if ris are basically constant which is what that histogram is showing and we know we generally think that the slip rate doesn't change over time so the question is how constant is d but if d is constant every time then ri is going to be constant every time so that seems to be an indirect support for the characteristic earthquake model that the slip prevents always the same and that then we can do an easy we can assume simple recurrence because if you have more of a, a Gutenberg Richter, then you have lots of different slip per event, lots of different Ds, because D goes with the magnitude. So then forecasting is a lot harder because it can be any size. And there's most likely going to be lots of small ones. So keeping going, so we already saw this. And one thing that comes in there is just that uh, sometimes our recurrence models have to allow for this kind of clustering. And this is seen, for example, remember my discussion yesterday in the C et al. 2008 paper about Mentali super cycles is that they may, we see this clustering. And his statement was that you have smaller events before the big one, which is a modified version of this story, which is no preferential big or small ones in in the sequence in the cluster. And so this also goes to the point about the slip rate variation that we might have a long-term geologic slip rate that we can measure, but we might have lots of earthquakes. And so over a short term, the slip rate's much higher. And so this gives us some problems for forecasting because if we're using the long-term rate as S in our recurrence model, we're going to uh, forecast fewer earthquakes than actually occur. So we kind of need to know, are we in or outside of a cluster if that's what's happening? And it's extremely hard to know because uh, the data are pretty poor. And that's why I think that C work and colleagues on the uh, Mentawi is so important because it actually can tell that we're in the cluster time. So then, uh, just to come basically to a close here, I, I showed this before. So this is a specific example from the Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast for California, where we we use the what we've been talking about as a rupture forecast, and then some other groups will do the shaking model, which is how do we get the earthquake shaking to the po the point so they apply the empirical relationship and so here i showed this calculation from usurf 2 so uniform california earthquake rupture forecast 2 and this is the earthquake probability uh for a magnitude 6.7 or larger so it's not shaking forecast it's, which is not like if you remember the earlier examples were probability of ground acceleration so you know, like 1G. So notice this is a map, but not of acceleration of earthquakes. So we're going to do earthquakes first, and then we'll hand it off to the engineers to do the sh ground shaking. So that's what, why this says earthquake rupture forecast and separate from shaking model. So this was a big group of F, big effort, and they included then these various components that we've been talking about, geodesy, geology, seismology. And they do the fault models, 
deformation models, earthquake rate models, and then the probability models. And try to uh, have this be a modular framework like the Lego, so over time we can change pieces out without changing the overall framework. So one thing that they use then is, is used in many seismic hazard models is logic trees. And so this is one thing I hadn't talked about before, but it'd be, let's say, as a group, we're going to do our seismic hazard, but uh, each of us has different ideas. So, uh, you know, Mudrick may say, well, I think the dip is 50. And, that, and then Gayatri says, well, no, it's 70. And then most of us say, well, no, we think it's 60. So how do we represent that difference of opinion? So you use the logic tree to do it. And so you say, all right, well, we're going to wait, meaning we're going to have different trees, have different uh, contributions to the calculation. So you see uh, we give the 60 because most of us agreed the majority thought that was the most uh, reasonable, 0.4. But we, we think, okay, Gayatri and Mudrik, their ideas are well supported as well. So 0.3 for those two. So that the sum of the weights are always one for each branch or each group of branches at that level. And so then you can see, okay, depth, you know, there's 12 to 15 kind of equally weighted, but 17, the deep one, maybe not so much. Keep going. Which way do we do the maximum magnitude, length or area? What's the maximum magnitude? Do we do characteristic or exponential? So you see mostly a characteristic model, but we use a little bit of exponential means Gutenberg-Richter. And then what's the slip rate? So you can see, okay, 0.01, point, so the high and larges are not as heavily weighted as the 0.07 of the favored slip model. So logic trees are commonly used. They're used in USERF. And here's an example of using a logic tree for moment only. So we have, you know, this depth of rupture, fault dip, rupture length, which rule we're going to use. So these are the empirical moment relationships from Wells and Coppersmith rupture length, rupture area, somebody else using uh, surface rupture length, and then slip rates for this one. And so when they calculate it, they do it a bunch of times, they get a range of expected maximum magnitudes. So this histogram then shows the, it accounts for the expert opinion and the uncertainty in the data and propagates it through to the magnitude. So it's not one single magnitude we expect for this structure, but a range of magnitudes from 6.6 .6 to 7.6. So it's a big range, but maybe it really represents better our uncertainty. So logic trees are an interesting concept, and they're very commonly used. So let's keep going, because we're almost done with this lecture. So here's just showing the user fault model. So the, this was the fault model from the mid-2000s, and this is the fault model now. So you see this is an example of this aleatory uncertainty. So this is what we knew maybe 10 years ago. This is what we think we know actually three years ago. So the Earth was the same between those those times, but the geology's understanding improved. We, we could characterize the Earth better. And so one thing that's going to happen when USERF 3 is announced, California is going to have higher earthquake hazards, and everyone's going to be mad. But it's, it's good that we know that. It's not... It's because we know there's more faults than we did before. So, but the, it means that there's more hazards, so many people will be maybe angry because their houses are suddenly in a more hazardous place than they saw. So then here's deformation models, so we, we can have slip rates on all these faults, so you see like this Central San Andreas has high rates, 35 millimeters a year, and there are low rate faults, so these blue ones, they're not that important, actually, because they <clears throat> have low slip rates, and so the slip prevent might be large, but the recurrence interval means it will be very long. But one thing that was included was to use both the slip rates, the knowledge about the fault, with also the geodetic model for the fault zone, what the 
trade accumulation rate is now. And this is actually maybe meaningful because this is the last decade of data. So if we want to think about the next decade of earthquake hazard, we may want to make sure we're using the most recent measurements of what's happening, right? So then we combine this, this information, all these faults, with their behavior and some distributed, we don't know, some area sources. Remember the beginning of my lecture? And we come up then with this forecast. And so it's a cumulative rate per year the function of magnitude. So it mostly looks empirical, mostly looks Greenberg Richter because we're doing everything, not just the fault. So there's earthquakes in the volume around the fault. But there are some characteristic events in here also. That's what gives us this final piece of the model. And so this doesn't include some of the time-dependent issues, what's not time-dependent at all. And so one example of time-dependent behavior would be the aftershock. So that's my seismic hazard assessment lecture for you guys, which, as you can see, is touching on almost all of our class. And so in that sense, it's starting to be a good summary for, for you because you should basically know most of these topics already, but we have reviewed them now several times in our class.